really a wonderful experience fishing. We have this one lake that is our favorite lake. It's called Lake Lilanona. It's in Newtown, not too far from where we live. In fact, we have, now that we live in Newtown, we can use their boat ramp. And when we both lived in New Haven, it was a good, oh, I'd say, hour to hour and 15 minutes away. But we spent a lot of time there anyways because it's one of the newer reservoirs in the state. It has a decent algae bloom in the middle of the summer. And it's got some structure to it. It's got the, probably the best structure of any lake in the state. And it's a good sized lake for yeah. Connecticut, that is. Well, we have been spending a lot of time mapping it. And I, I have a, a key map. And on the key map, I would just show, like, I have map number one, map number two, map number three on the key map. And then I'd have a little diagram of each one. And I would actually put in my sightings on the map. Because I, I really don't mind sitting down and, you know, dropping the anchor yeah, and drawing a sighting though. up. Drawing yeah. this one over here, and Tammy would get into it. And in fact, some of the sightings I call the Tammy sighting because she picked it out, and they were really she knows how to pick them out. She yeah. knows that you want something close to you and something far away. Yeah. So that when you move your head a little bit, that sighting moves. Yeah, isn't you that know you you moves? can pinpoint your spot. Yeah. So we had done that to a lot of the lake. There's still a couple structures I'd like to map on, but we've got most of them. And the productive, we know which ones are productive. And really had a good time on that lake. We went out there one time, this was last year, and we decided, well, geez, we don't need our depth sound. Let's just leave it at home, take it off the boat completely. Let's just go out there with the maps. So we left, and the maps were in a little binder. Turns out we left the maps on the coffee table. We get to the, dot, to the uh, boat ramp, where's the maps? On the coffee table. And we realized that's not so much of a problem, because we remembered these structures. We went from structure to structure. This was like in September of the year. And we caught largemouth and smallmouth that day. Uh, good sized stringer of them, three to four pounds. And we remembered most of our sightings. And the ones we didn't remember, we were able to get back pretty quick because we'd make a couple passes and we'd work our way out to them. And that's right, we would line up that bridge abutment with the hillside, you know, that kind of thing. And we had one of our best days fishing. We had no maps with us except the ones in our heads. Um, no depth no depth finder, and we had a very productive day on at least four or five different structures we had fish. It was fantastic, and I felt really good at the end of the day. I felt like, geez, you know, this is the stuff that Buck has taught us that is just invaluable. I mean, when would we ever have come up with something, you know, had the time to come up with something like that? And we actually caught fish, we had a great time, and we knew exactly where we were on these structures. Yeah. And it was from, it was from yeah. all that work we did with the pencil and paper and something? picking out the sightings, dropping the anchor, taking out the notebook and the eraser. I always have that eraser there because, you know, I'm not the greatest artist in the world. You know, just committing stuff to paper. We remembered it, you know. A uh, class field trip, you know, a class one. He takes them and he runs the small lures with them. He shows them how to run the small lures. You know what I mean? It's keep them in position and stuff. And, he says, ah, I gotta try and fix this. He comes back in the dock and I'm getting ready to go out with two other guys for the mapping phase. And he says, I gotta, I gotta fix this depth find where it ain't working. And I didn't pay much attention to him. And I'm just about ready to push off. And I says, can I help you with something? And he says, well, if I can't fix it, you can't fix it. And I said, well, don't fix it. He said, well, what do you mean? I says, you can't go out there and run them little lures on these bars you've been running a hundred times? With that damn depth finder, you're only running the 500, 400, and 250. Well, you don't use a depth finder for that, do you? Well, he just has the depth finder. It's the, the crutch. You see what I mean? He went out there with the three small lures. He had the best time he's ever had in the life. They caught two muskies and I think a walleye. You know, while he had these two guys in the boat, he said, Terry, I had the best time I ever had. No goofy thing to be looking at, you know, and he said, I knew where I was going out there. It wasn't even so much a line size. Knew the lay of the land. He turned in, you know, he knew to start this far from shore with the 250, the 400, and he turned in, and when the lure started to bump, he just worked it out, then he cut back, you know what I mean? The bump again, cut out, and he caught, the, like I say, two fish in the, in the walleye. And uh, he had a great time. He had a great time. About? Rocky, yeah. He had a great time, so, you know, he got a <laughs> big old Rocky, he got kind of proud of himself, you know? <laughs> and he says, I really did good. He said, I'm going to have one of these. So when I do put the 200 on, I mean, there are, there are times I've mapped bars just for kick, partly for kicks and partly because of the boat traffic without putting on a single marker. I go out there and run my contours. And by the time I get out to the 250, I'm looking around and looking around, and I can see what, 
what I'm going to start using for sightings with the 200. And then I'll, I'll make my passes with the 200. Always, always using sightings because I have to move them. I have to adjust them. Take a guess at where to, you know, then you can have a, you, you can guess pretty close where the 100 should be run. You, know, you just move your sighting a little bit. Go right on down to the wire until you can't hit anything else. Sometimes that happens before you go to wire. You know you've hit a brake line because you, you make a pass and you, you have a nice bump. You move that thing over just a little bit, that sighting, make another pass, can't hit you can't line. hit anything. Move it back in, you hit again. You move it back out, you hit nothing. Let some extra line out and take that same run, you hit nothing. You know you've had a drop off there because you can't, you just moved over a little bit and you can't touch bottom for anything. Mm -hmm. That's where your drop off is. And there have been times where on some of, some of the lakes up in Connecticut where there's so much boat traffic, you put a marker out, it gets run over half a dozen times. Yeah. But if you, and these are kind of extreme situations. It's, it's obviously, you can save yourself a lot of time by placing that marker. And I think saving time is a real important thing because you have some pretty big lakes. You've got to save some time. You can't always, and if you can, if you can take a look at it with the marker, uh, and that's one of the things I'm looking forward to for, on tomorrow and Thursday is learning how to save some time out there. I'd like to learn to save a little more time. Uh, I, you know, just like, like in anything in life, you, know, you, you do it. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. Some ways take forever, some, some ways are quick. And the, obviously the quick ones are gonna put you onto the next structure that much sooner. So, but I, I've had, I found that uh, it can be done totally with line sites. Mm -hmm. Running sure the contours, and then just start picking up line sites. And then I've gone back home after that and actually drawn the thing from memory. Because you're always looking around. I can't draw the line sites in from memory but I, I can draw the shape of the bar because I've run it so much with the, with the different lures I can tell pretty much where it's going. And then I go back and, and I'll, I'll refine the map. Every time I go there, I'll re, you know, put some little more detail into it, draw the line sights, and, yeah. you know, so that when, when I... And uh, I found it to be a real, a real helpful thing, line sights. I, I think probably out of all this stuff, the mapping and the line sights have been the biggest single help for me. Mm -hmm. And in the book, in the study guide, the part that really, really strikes home with me is where Buck talks about not letting that depth sound dominate. Place your marker and turn the damn thing off. Because I know personally for me, I can't remember a damn thing if I'm watching that depth sounder, but if I don't pay any attention to it and I'm using line sights, I get a much better feel for the shape of the bar. Mm -hmm. for any, I can, I can you feel gotta what's going on. on the lures. Yeah, I can't use all my senses at once, and, and you know, I like to use that sense of feel with the lure. And if I'm watching the depth sounder, I got to start all over again because I still don't know where I was. I just know what I was seeing with the depth sounder. It's like watching TV. You miss life. You know, mm -hmm. the real thing out there, the real thing that's happening. Those, those sightings. Are gonna... Yeah, you know, it's and like I said. Um, I said this for Roy and Danny's benefit. Don't be too anxious to get the lure in the water. Well, Make right. sure they understand what you're doing, or how you arrived at what you're going to do here before you do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all they'll do is they'll say, hey, this guy threw a marker at 10 feet. That's all you got to do, throw the marker at 10 feet and run mm -hmm. the lures. I said, oh, God, what if I run the shallows? I don't bother with that. Just get out here outside the marker. That's where we caught the fish. <laughs> you understand what I mean? And that, well, that sounds kind of shitty to us. It's pretty logical to a guy looking to catch a fish. Well, you know, once again, in the study guide, Buck talks, he, he lists about three or four things that you learn from running your lures in the shallows. You know, yeah. You can feel the bottom, you know, if it's hard, you know, if it's soft, you yeah. know, if there's any little humps or anything in there. Also, if there's a movement going on, there's probably going to be some little ones hitting up in there. So you know if the fish are moving or not at that particular time. You get a good feel for what the water color is, how the weeds in there. And there's a lot to be learned from running those little lures. And even if you're not, maybe you don't catch your biggest fish in there. Although, uh, you know, that, that sometimes happens. that can happen too. Uh, it happens. There's a lot to be learned from running those little lures, and I think it's important that the procedures be followed because those things will never be learned by going directly to the deep Without water. Doing it the right way. Aside from the fish don't miss by not going into the yeah. shallow. We're catching a lot of smallmouth at 12 feet, the first break line. 
nothing was happening at 17 feet. Absolutely nothing. And we spent some time there. Go back to 12, we start banging them again. Mm -hmm. If we had just gone to 17 saying, well, that's the, most, you would have missed the only the place, well, we wouldn't have done our job for one thing. We wouldn't have worked from the shallows to the deep. I mean, we didn't start at 12, we, we ran the shallow yeah, lures. Right. We got out to 12, we started hitting them. From 9 to 12, really. Yeah. And uh, very regularly, and then below that there was nothing. Yeah. But without going through the procedures, we would not have learned that. We would not have learned that there were, the fish had mm -hmm. moved up to around 12 feet, they were holding right there, uh, nothing was moving down below. Look at Harold, he takes that student out, and he runs through the lures, he winds up running into a school of fish. How big is <laughs> yeah. well, What was that, Harold? Right. Tell, tell him about that, Harold. Yeah. Was, was the last, last time a guy had never been spoon put in his life, a proper fisherman came in my office, saw my fish pictures, I gave him a copy of the little gray book, mm -hmm. say read this, it makes sense to you, come back. He read it and said, this makes sense. I said, well, order the green book. He ordered the green book off the internet with Buck. Got that. I said, now I'm ready to take you fishing. I took him out. I told Terry about this. I do run small lures. But this particular day, because I had the student, I wanted to make sure that he saw everything from, from A to B. I started off at the 500, showing him how to let the line out. He, like most beginners, he got the line caught yeah. the prop a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> also the line. But anyway, I started with 500, 400, 250, nothing. Took him to a bar, kind of troll that, 500, 400, 250. So now we're going to straight line the big lures. Took him down to 700. Now this guy never finished. Nothing. And I said, well, another feeder and a bar up here. I said, we're going to just, what they call scatter troll. I said, I'm going to put on, I was on the outside. So I'm going to put on a 200. You're going you're gonna to be on the inside with a 250. Let out about 20 yards of animal, let out about 25. Made one pass across that bar. Bang. Good pass. Mark out. He got his line in. I said, well, so I can go to the cast. I said, but I'm going to make one more pass. Instead of going up, turning and making the pass back the same way, I went back the opposite direction and Terry tell you, this is hard to do. Bang. I hadn't got 20 yards of line out. Bang. Now I'm sitting there with a marker here and a marker there. Oh, it's great. I said, where you want to anchor? I told him, I said, where you want to anchor this boat? He said, between those two markers. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I put the anchor down, right spot. He couldn't even cast a regular spoon plug. You know, Terry was telling me about an underhand cast, but he was getting it out there, like Mr. Perry said. If you can swing it around like, and get it out to the right spot, you're going to catch a fit. First cast on a regular free running spoon plug, he hooked one. He got him up to the boat, got off. I said, wait a minute. I said, let me show you how to do this. And I popped three on the cast with fast right. like a, Yeah, because they were there. They were up all over the place. Then he started catching them. Those fish stayed up a good 45 minutes. You wouldn't believe it. I don't know how many, I don't know how many caught and released. It must have been 30 or 35. Then when they dropped off a little bit, took the silver buddy. A little deeper, bang, 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 every cast. And he's catching them off the silver buddy. They hadn't even seen the silver buddy before. And I'd I send him a couple of pictures. Yeah. The guy, he thought this was supposed to happen every time. <laughs> oh, you just spoke Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is easy. Yeah. I, I, I like this bad yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is what Mr. Perry is talking about. I said, yeah. I said, but let me tell you something. I said, now, nobody can be this lucky. First day on the water, go through the procedure and get into a school of fish on the cat. Yeah. I said, this, this is what every spoon plugger wants to do. I said, but it doesn't accomplish every time you go out there. Yeah, that yeah, that <laughs> picture. Tough day. Nothing moving, clear blue. Coming in at the evening, the section that I drew a little map of it. I said, we're gonna make a trolling pass on this section. I said, I've caught a big several big bass here. He comes up, you know, 
I'm tired, you know, but we may, I'm in the inside, he's on the outside. With 100, I'm running to 200. Get this little shell. He said, I'm hung up. I said, okay. So I got my line in, turned the boat around, and go back. I got about from here to the TV film, and guess what's hung up? Four and a half pound bass. <laughs> he thought he was hung. Now, Terry said if I hadn't gone back, he'd have never got. He was hung about one belly hook. And I could see him. I said, don't keep your rod down. I said, I'll net this fish. I said, don't lift him. Don't, don't make him jump. If he jumped, he's gone. And I picked the fish up in the net. The weight of the fish broke that one belly hook off. So there you go. He got a four and a half pound bass. I sent, sent the fishes to Terry. I would have never caught that fish. If it had been me, he'd have gone. He'd have been gone. But, but he's a, he's a good student. But he doesn't have anything to unlearn. You know, he he, he doesn't have any preconceived notions. He can't cast. I'm gonna have to give him some private casting lessons to get him in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Really comes up to you, you know, when that weather gets a little cold, and you just, Harold, why can't I catch him anymore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> He'll say the magic is gone, mm -hmm. Harold. But he asked that same question they asked you, Terry. Yeah. Yeah. What makes him move? What makes him move? I don't know. Boy, if I knew the answer to that, man, I'd be wrong. Okay. The highest.